Hey, hey, and it's off to Central America we go today, specifically Costa Rica and Panama. And along for the ride today in this care collab for Catlia Dawiana is Karin's Orchids, Ed's Orchids, and Matt by Nature. So welcome to this video regarding how I care for my Catlia Dawianas. I have two little ones here in Southern Spain. This was not a difficult orchid to remember the name by. I didn't have to do much practicing because it is also called Dao's Cattleya. Even though it's spelled differently, I'm very familiar with Dao's back in the day when I used to live in Kenya and they came to the Mombasa port during the monsoon season, all the way from Dubai and places like that, loaded with dates. And we were always very, very happy back in the day to get those fresh dates coming in. So I remember Dao's very, very well. Hence, this Cattleya name was not difficult to remember, seeing as it is also sometimes referred to as Dao's Cattleya. So Cattleya Dawiana. We know now that it comes from Costa Rica and Panama. And upon researching this orchid before bringing it into my collection, in the hopes that it would do well for me, I recognize that it is sort of a cool to warm grower, maybe intermediate, but its native temperatures don't drop below 16 degrees Celsius and I can do that. And also its native temperatures go up to 35 degrees Celsius and I can do that too. Sometimes I go up a little bit higher, up to 40 degrees Celsius, but I have them both in Lekka and self-watering to counteract the lack of humidity because where this one comes from, it much prefers 70% humidity, no less than that. And I cannot do that. I have here in Southern Spain an average of 30% humidity for about six months of the year, maybe seven, depending. So that is extremely dry. Hence, yep, when I did that research, I thought Lekka, self-watering, perfect. And so far, the setup hasn't disappointed. I cannot show you any blooms. I do apologize. But if there's anything to go by from the pictures that I see, I very much look forward to being able to one day experience the blooms of the Dawianas and share them with you. They are super unique and they are sometimes classified as triple lip, but it is difficult to determine the triple lip because there's no real differential in where are the divisions. But because of its floofy uniqueness and the different line striations and markings that it has, it has this feature of triple lip that makes it also very, very much a coveted orchid in many, many collections. And a blooming size orchid will cost a pretty penny to be sure. I got mine as a seedling, which is over here, which is my second one, that is the Dawiana Aurea. And this one I got in 2019, was the only orchid I bought in 2019. I was good back then with my compulsive purchases. <laughs> but I got her and I saw her on eBay from a French nursery as a juvenile, as I like to call them. They're past the seedling stage and on to maturing, but not quite blooming size. Buscal Orchidee, and I was super impressed. Not only was the price reasonable, I paid 37 euros for it, but the quality of the orchid made me kick myself that I didn't buy two. And that is the one exception I have to say about eBay purchases, Buscal Orchidee. Honestly, I cannot say anything but good things about them. So these two have just been doing their thing in my setup here for the past two years that they've been with me, but doing very, very well. Before I get into that, we were talking about the temperatures. So my summers, easy peasy, I can take care of them, self-watering, low humidity, that sort of counteracts each other. But in the winter, this past winter of January 2021, we dropped down to 14 degrees Celsius in my dining room where they live throughout the winter months. So the tall one is right up on the top shelf under blurple lights. And the little one is on a shelf that is under shop lights. And I have, the only reason I make the difference here is because of the size of the pot and those, that shelf along the shop lights. There's measurement and precision in order to get as many orchids to fit on that shelf. So small pots, shop lights, and then the bigger one goes under the blurple lights. That's the only difference. Seeing as they're not really in active growth during my winter, 
I don't need them to be under any other kind of lights to support any blooming or any growth. It's just to extend the daylights that are limited because being so close to the equator, they like 10 to 12 hours of light. And I only get maybe eight hours of light a day on a sunny day when the angle of the sun can penetrate through and into the racks of my dining room. But on a cloudy day, that is a very dark room, even though it is on the west side of the property facing south. It is still quite dark if the sun doesn't shine. And these guys like a lot, a lot of light. Now I have mine in the summer directly behind a curtain on the east side of my patio. So long as the sun is shining because I don't want to burn the leaves. Right now, I keep watching. Yeah, it's okay. The sun is not as strong today, so I'm okay filming it and it is standing in the sun. But on the sunny, sunny days, early mornings, that curtain is down. And then when the sun starts to creep up over the building, I lift up the curtain and then all the light can filter through the other orchids that are in front of these two. So they get a lot, a lot of light, but I don't give them at this point any direct sun. I do believe that that would be far too much because of my low humidity. I don't need additional dehydration stress through the leaves. Almost look like they are in a deep shade, but they're not because all the walls, the curtain, everything is white and it reflects a lot of light. So they're okay. If that is enough for blooming, I do not know. At this point in time, I'm not particularly focused on blooming. I am focusing on getting them to bulk up and grow. And you can see how cool another new growth is coming here quick touch of the leaves. If they get a bit too hot, then we shall move. It's coming along really nicely. Whether it's going to surpass this bulb, I do not know. But I have another little bulge right here. So if it's going to produce two new growths for me and they don't size up to be as big as maybe this bulb right here, then I'm okay with that. The more storage organs I can get into this orchid, the more roots I have, and then eventually, maybe next year, on this one, we're gonna see some blooms if I'm getting the light levels right. Right now, my focus is growth. Lots of growth and keeping the leaves as damage-free as possible. The same with the little one here. Gorgeous, stonking new growth coming. Look at it on its profile. So that is already much bigger than the one that went prior. I can tell that because of where the sheath leaf is at this margin right here. Let me show you. This little sheath indentation you can see here is pretty much about the size where the pseudobulb will actually mature. There's still some room left for growth, but it's already substantially stronger and bigger than what the previous one was. So this one is coming along really, really well as well. I don't know what happened at the nursery when I got it. You can see the black lines here. One leaf had been sort of chopped off to make it look prettier. So I don't know what happened there, but the subsequent growth was really good. That worked out well with the light levels. And the next one is well on its way. Very pleased with these two. I did a repot on this one last year because within one year my 15 centimeter pot had filled with roots to maintain the health and climate in the pot regarding oxygen exchange i didn't do a harsh repot on the big one i just literally did what we like to do with this inorganic growing method lift her out of the pot have a little look see and see if there's any cleanup need to be done but if there isn't that much then just up the pot size by one and fill around with Lekka. And that's what this one had last year. The root system was divine. I have absolutely no hesitations that it's doing great in the pot. I've got the gargling going through the Lekka when I flush. I've got the gargling and the bubbles coming up when I fill the pot with water to see how much oxygen is still in the pot. Everything, the climate in the pot, to my understanding, is perfect. When they are not in active growth, I do not fertilize. Usually in winter, there's nothing going on. They only get enough water in the reservoir that maintains the wetness of the microfiber. Very rarely is there any water sitting in the reservoir. 
because I don't want the evaporative cooling of the lecker to negatively affect the health of the roots. In my head, I'm always guessing that there's a three degree differential between what the ambient air is opposed to what is in the pot because of the lecker. This winter, it was a bit touch and go with the 14 degrees Celsius. And I'm thinking there's 11 degrees Celsius in my pot. And in its nature, it doesn't like to go below 16 degrees hanging on a tree. That is ambient air of 16 degrees. Oof, and I am putting it through the paces of possibly 11 degrees in the pot in the winter. Yeah, so my microfiber stays damp. I do not have any water in the deposit of the reservoir. If I need to, make sure that the roots inside the pot are not going to desiccate because of the lecker going too dry, I will flush it through once or twice and then leave it again. But in the summer, the reverse is true. This one loves its water. When it is in active growth, it's almost like keep that reservoir full. I flush a lot, almost every second to every third day. And before I fill the reservoir up again with fresh fertilizer, I flush through the pots using the masks respectively as my measure. And I use plain RO water for that. And then I just fill the reservoir up again with my 300 parts per million of MSU fertilizer for this one. And this little one gets 160 until it absorbs everything. And then the whole cycle repeats itself. I have heard that these orchids are fussy, finicky. I am lucky. I guess, because I don't consider them fussy or finicky at all. If I had fussy and finicky orchids, then they have already died because I overestimated my competence with regards to how I can tweak their culture here in my hot, dry climate. These two have never missed a beat from the moment I got them to the moment I potted them up to the moment of repotting. There's never been a setback or anything of the sorts. So I don't want to say it's an easy grower if somebody else is finding them difficult. I don't want to be that bold. But for me personally, they have been easy. And that is all I can say. And if you're considering buying a Dawiana and you're like, nah, it's got a reputation of being fussy. May I just tell you that maybe that's not the case from my point of view. <laughs> and I encourage you to get one. I have not had any pest issues on this one either. None of them. I had little signs of scale on other orchids over the winter, which I dealt with very quickly and they never came back. But these two, never ever an issue. I do give them now from May through September a silicon soak once a month at 100 parts per million with a pH of 6.3. My pH is always going to be a little bit lower because my leka is stored in RO water at 8 pH. So when it goes into the pot, despite being pH neutral, as they say, whatever the water pH is that you store the leka in, that is the pH that the leka is. So 6.3 pH, if I'm really focusing on the upper scale of the nutrient chart, because by the time the 6.3 gets absorbed up through the leka, then it will be like 6.5 or 6.6 .6 by the time it reaches the top to balance and counteract that 8 pH that I have my LECA stored in. If I want to target the lower pH absorbing nutrients, I put in the nutrient solution at 5.8. That sounds all a little bit complicated if you hear it the first time, but really it's not. It just depends on what it is, which nutrient you want to push through the orchid and then in my case, I lower to 5.8, never below that. And by the time it gets absorbed up through the pot, then I'm expecting it to be at around 6.1, 6.2. And if I'm targeting the higher spectrum of the nutrient chart, I use a pH of 6.3 and the same thing, it will then absorb. And by the time it is absorbed all through the LECA, it'll be at 6.5. So I hope all of that makes sense. If not, please, please feel free to leave me a comment and ask me about what I was just talking about with regard to the pH and the LECA. But that is, I just wanted to point that out in order to make sure that all the nutrients are covered and absorbed evenly, plus my now every monthly soak for the next six months up to September of silicon. I don't do silicon throughout the winter. There's no point if there's no active growth. And besides, again, I don't want to flood the roots 
in a very cold environment. That is how I take care of my Cattleya dawianas. And I look forward to hopefully being around to share the blooms with you one day. Thank you once again to Ed's Orchids, Karin's Orchids, and Matt by Nature for joining me on this Care Collab regarding Cattleya dawiana. I have the links to their channels in the description below, which I will update to their specific videos when they upload and I can grab the link and update my description. Thank you so much also for your time, for watching. Again, any questions that you might have, leave them in the comments below. I'll be happy to answer as best as I can. Have a wonderful day and thank you so much for watching. Please stay safe and take care. Bye.